Hi, good night everyone. Uh, welcome to our first session. We're so glad to have you here. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick welcome and go through the house rules for today. Uh, pretty much simple. Mute your microphones, please. Um, use the discussion chat to ask any questions you may have during a presentation. Uh, most times Dr. Bola usually handles the chat. Thanks Dr. Bola for that. Um, raise your hand to speak if you have a question and uh, most importantly participate. Uh, today's session uh, will be worth one CET credit. Uh, you can find the sign up sheet at the top of this chat or during the meeting notes. Uh, so that's it for me, Dr. Kumar. Uh, you're muted. I just realized that actually. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for um, joining us um, on this um, course to educate ourselves. Um, good participation. I can see everybody eager at this point of time. Um, the agenda for this evening is that we have a couple of interesting case presentations to start with. Um, these are cases that um, are presented to our, our clinic as emergencies. And the theme today is to talk about emergency eye care. And I will take you all through some of my experiences um, in UK and in uh, Trinidad uh, with some cases that I have seen around. Um, and um, thank you, Dr. Bola, for um, looking after the chat. Please ask um, as many questions as possible and keep them busy. And we have Dr. Dwarka as well uh, joining us. Um, and they will be supporting us during the case discussions and uh, panel discussion at the end of the meeting. Um, so I will start off um, by getting Zarid to get his presentation um, uploaded and to crack off, please. Hi, good evening everybody. I'm Dr. Mohammed and I'll be presenting one of the cases for this evening's session. So the case starts with uh, a history. So it's a 32 year old male, no past medical history. And he reported experiencing blurry vision in his left eye after performing some strenuous work two days prior to presentation. So his findings, his visual acuity on his right eye was 0.1 logma pinhole, and his left eye was 0.4. His intraocular pressure on his right eye was 12, and on his left eye was 10. On slit arm examination, we noted he had bilateral temporal pterygia, with his left eye being a little wider than his right, so approximately by one millimeter. On examination for the fundus, we were able to see this image. And this is upon the photograph of his right eye. And on comparison to his left, we noted this. So on closer inspection, we can see an area of hemorrhage here at the juxtaphobial region, highlighted in the, the yellow circle. So with OCT angiogram, his right eye, there were no, no findings there. But on his left eye, if we look a little closer at the OCT and geography of the deep layers, we can see an area here coinciding with what we notice on the on this image below here circled in yellow again. Um, it, there's a minimal distortion of the foveal area and uh, it is an intraretinal lesion as well. If we do a comparison of the retina map between his right and left eyes, you can appreciate the, the difference between both eyes here a little better. Um, highlighted again by the yellow arrow. And if we look at this area below with the black circle, uh, black square, sorry, we can see they are changing three quadrants 
coincide with the change in the, in the phobia contour. Two weeks later, and again looking at his fondness of his right eye, we mean the normal, and his left eye, we see the same area in quest having resolved. So no hemorrhage was noted at this point. Again, which repeat OCT and geography, and see his right eye and his left eye with resolution. And with comparison on previous presentation on the image on top two weeks later, you can see there's return of normal foveal contour and resolution. So, uh, we diagnosed this patient who had a juxtaphoveal hemorrhage with Valsalva retinopathy and a possible macular telangiectasia. Uh, so to briefly discuss what uh, Valsalva retinopathy is, it's basically a rupture of the small superficial capillaries in the macular region, le leading to extravasation of blood into the retina, usually below the ILM or the internal limiting membrane layer. But it could also present with hemorrhages into the vitreous cavity because of breakthrough through the ILM layer or the subhyloid space. So the image below here, we can appreciate where the ILM is. Uh, superficial vessels will pass just above here, and then the choroid is the, on the other side of the retina, which is below in this region. Uh, the causes for uh, Valsalva retinopathy is normally due to any intrathoracic or intraabdominal increase in pressure. So the most common causes are coughing, vomiting, any strenuous lifting or, or exertion. Sometimes constipated patients may present like this. Any uh, wind-based instrument patients and also compression injuries or trauma. They will normally present with a sudden painless loss of vision and on examination we may appreciate retinal hemorrhages typically in the macular area which can vary in size. Uh, they are normally located under the ILM and usually appears as a well circumscribed rounded red elevated area. Uh, they may or may not cause hemorrhagic detachment of the ILM at that time. Differentials we would have considered for this patient. Uh, if you are diabetic, we would have thought of a diabetic retinopathy, but we would have seen heart exudates and neovascularization present as well. Could have also thought of a hemorrhagic posterior vitreous detachment or even hypertensive retinopathy, but in that case, we would have seen other signs such as attenuation of the vessels or AV nicking. Aneurysms would have also been possible, but they would have commonly had intraretinal hemorrhages. With sickle cell patients, we would have seen what is characteristically described as salmon patches and any C fan areas of neovascularization, which wasn't present for him. And with Pusher's retinopathy, we would have seen cotton wool spots or areas of retinal whitening. Also, if he was anemic, we would have seen some areas of intraretinal hemorrhages and rot spots as well. Uh, so, to briefly uh, run through what macular telangiectasia is, because that's what we were thinking as well, it is commonly called MACTEL and leads to abnormalities of the capillaries in the foveal or the perifoveal region, normally associated with loss of the outer nuclear layers and the ellipsoid zone that can progress to the cystic cavitation changes throughout all the layers. So, on the images below, uh, these are what they typically look like. So with this on the bottom left image with the black arrow, you can see what dilated venules will look like. Towards the middle here with the black arrows as well, you can see what temporal capillary dilation is. And to the far right, again with black arrows, you can see what pigment dilation along cap dilated capillaries will appear like. So to confirm these, uh, these patients normally undergo fluorescein angiogram. And we can see the difference here. So they get hypofluorescent regions, uh, which are typically leaking capillaries, indicated by the black arrow. Uh, uh, and to close off, I chose to go through some of the common uh, OCT findings with emergency patients. So the top image, or which is image 1A, can see what diabetic macular edema looks like on OCT. And you can see the intraretinal cystic spaces in figure 1b. This is a, a 
retinal detachment with extensive subretinal fluid with ARMD, again with subretinal fluid in image 1C, but you can appreciate that's almost speculated type pattern. And with figure 1D, this is a temporal pigment epithelial detachment with adjacent intraretinal exudates, as highlighted here by the arrow. In CSCR or chorioretinopathy, you can see this in image 1E with a focal pigment epithelial detachment. And in 1F, these are multifocal large pigment epithelial detachments, with the larger one being here and the smaller one being more nasally. And this was the end of my presentation. And at this point, we'll um, have any discussions here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zarid. Um, I noticed that uh, before I start asking Dr. Bola any questions, Jan has got his hand up. Um, Jan, did you want to ask something? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if he's got his. Um... OK, I'll come back. I think you probably mean me, Jan, Jan is not hearing me. I, I can hear you now. I did not have any question. Jan Böhringer. Oh, yes, yes, I saw your hand up, so I was wondering if there was a question that you wanted to ask us. I think my, my I think my under JB, I think. But uh, right, okay. somebody, somebody else. Somebody I think. else? Oh, sorry, sorry, Jan. But uh, I don't have any uh, questions. Okay, that's fine, okay. Dr. Bola, um, any thoughts on this uh, interesting case um, uh, gentleman who had presented to us was very, very anxious when he walked in. Any thoughts about um, um, this patient or your experience in seeing foveal hemorrhages? Yeah, yes, Vin, uh, could, could Zara just put back up the uh, picture of the, um, the, the hemorrhage? Okay. So, so you thought did the patient have a a valsalva? Yes. Um. Basically, what, what he presented history? with uh, his presentation was that of uh, acute drop in vision in that left eye after strenuous activity for two days. What what sort of strenuous activity? So he was lifting something, I think, if I remember right which involved a lot of exertion. That's what he presented with. OK. Um, there was no compressive forces on his chest. He was not involved in any fight, which somebody pressed on his chest or anything else, which we were thinking of, or he did not have any blood discracias. Um, we did his bloods and um, everything came back as normal. Um, he did not have any family history of um, diabetes or hypertension or any other issues that um, commonly you start thinking of um, in patients who present with acute spontaneous bleeds like this. So we got mm -hmm. his bloods done. So we in fact asked him to do a fluorescein angiogram, but he didn't get around to doing a fluorescein angiogram. But because we had the OCTMA, um, we were quite comfortable with that. And in three weeks it had resolved. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't pursue doing a fluorescein angiogram in him. And in periphery of his eyes, we did not notice any tail injectiasis in the periphery as well. So um, that we presume that this was an isolated um, T injectasia in the macular region um, located purely in the left eye, presenting with this kind of a hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. So let's see the angio again. OCTMA. Yeah. That's what we have here. Yeah, yeah. You see it. And you see the arrow that yeah. comes up. Yeah, I, I would say that th th this. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen Mactel present with a acute retinal hemorrhage like that. So that's that would be a pretty rare presentation for the Mactel. So I, I would go with it being a, a, a Valsalva type uh, bleed. Um, you know, if if I was if I was to um, say what it might be. But I, I think you're right. You have to think of the most common cause of retinal hemorrhage, although it doesn't fit 
with you know the usual suspects, things like diabetic um, retinopathy. So I would say, you know, do the bloods like you did there. Um, things like anemia, um, things like uh, um, uh, other causes of, of retinal hemorrhaging. It doesn't look like a vein occlusion at all because it's smack in the macula. It, it doesn't look like all the things that we usually see with uh, retinal hemorrhaging, like a CNVM or anything like that. So I think you really have an, an odd looking intraretinal hemorrhage. Um, and I, I would say the diagnosis is, is probably exactly what you said because of the way the history went. And um, the fact that it resolved means um, I, I don't think you need to do much more um, to follow up on it, um, you know, that hemorrhage, unless it recurs. Yeah, that would be interesting you because know. the follow up OCTA um, pretty much showed a resolution of that tiny capillary change as well. I think Zarid will be able to show us that. Um, so that was also interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so really, I, I don't think it's a MAC. It's not a MAC tell. That's what we initially yeah. thought it was a MAC tell. And then we had to revise our um, initial diagnosis because there was a complete resolution. And as I yeah. said, um, what, what we found interesting um, in my experience in the last um, year and a quarter in Trinidad is that we see a lot of undetected macular tail injectaceous. Um, a variant of Coates disease. Um, that is what is interesting. Um, so that's why it made me um, um, come up with a possible differential of uh, MACTEL in this gentleman. But as you and as we know that we have to look out for the other eye, we know about the variations that occur with macular tail injectasia. And I think a lot of our colleagues in the community, particularly um, uh, within the uh, within the practices which have OCT facility, they see a lot of macular tail injectasia um, on evaluation. Okay. Um, okay. I don't know why I'm not. Okay, Jan. Jan, you wanted to ask us something. Jan. Do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Um, question to Dr. Bola. And uh, if it was MacTel, how would you treat it? So, re really, we don't have uh, a treatment for the MacTel that is effective. So, it is, uh, most MacTel we tend to. Um, look out for any complications related to the telangiectasia. And the most worrisome thing with MACTEL is if they fo uh, start forming uh, choroidal neovascular membranes. And when they start doing that, they start to get uh, subretinal fibrosis. So the MACTEL itself, we can't um, treat with things like Evastin or laser or anything like that. So that's one of the little downsides to the diagnosis of MACTEL. It, uh, as I said, they don't usually present with an acute bleed like that. Um, but if you do see, like let's say we didn't have OCTA or we couldn't do an angiogram, then what you have to look out for if somebody get an intraretinal hemorrhage and you're thinking it have some MACTEL features, then you really need to look out for uh, 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 clinical features or OCT features of a CNVM, which would be things like uh, uh, not only hemorrhage within the retinal uh, uh, layers or the intraretinal layers, but also subretinal hemorrhage, subretinal um, edema, or intraretinal edema or cystic formation. So if you see anything like that, then you're going to be thinking it might be a CNBM and we're going to have to use some sort of anti-VGA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bola. Um, I know Dr. Dwarka is with us um, on the group as well. Dr. Dwarka, I'm not sure if you heard the case. Any comments on um, this case? Hi, everybody. Good, good evening and thanks, Vinit, for asking me. So I didn't hear the full case, but I saw it earlier today for a short while. I think the re reasoning and the, the thought processes that went behind, I agree with, and I will 
Yes, the differentials that we brought up include in MacTel, but because of its unilateral nature and because of the type of presentation, I would probably go with what Dr. Bola was trying, basically pointing out, that is more likely to be in the Valsalva type things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dwarka. Um, yes, my experience in the UK with this kind of scenario is that we had interretinal bleeds and also preretinal bleeds. I will talk about it in my presentation later on. Um, thank you, Zared. Thank you, Dr. Dwarka and Dr. Dr. Bola. Um, I'm going to bring on um, next uh, Vikash, uh, Dr. Badesi, who is our um, other trainee to present the next case. Um, any questions about this first case and the second case, please ask on the chat. Um, Dr. Bola is active on the chat, so he will respond to all your questions and we can have discussion afterwards if there is any more. Hi, hello everybody. Um, so I'm going to share my presentation, my case presentation today. Yeah, everybody can see my screen, right? Uh, Lots Kumar? Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is a 53-year-old East Indian female. She first presented to us complaining of blurred vision in left eye uh, for approximately one month. It was associated with a recurrent headaches and a dull and boring in nature. Her past medical history, she's a type 2 non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus and hypertensive for the past 10 years. She's also overweight. Her past ocular history was nil. On her examination findings, her visual acuity was best corrected with spectacles with 0.3 on the right eye and 0.2 on the left eye. Her intraocular pressures using tonopen on the right was 14 and the left was 15. Her anterior segment findings on the right eye was normal. The left eye of note, her conjunctiva, there was no conjunctivitis noted, but on the cornea, there were minute carotid precipitates noted. Her anterior chamber, there were three plus cells with no flare and her lens was normal. We then went on to do our slit lamp examination of the fundus and we also got some fundus photos which is shown here. So in the right eye compared to the left eye, we can see that there is an obvious difference where the left eye, there's a generalized hazy appearance of the retina with the left disc margins being less well demarcated when compared to the right eye. Um, looking nasally, we can see that in the left eye, we can see that there's a white subretinal lesion noted nasal to the disc. And given the appearance of the blood vessel from this photo, you can see it here, this appearance, it, was, it, it can be um, noted that the lesion is raised. There was also no other abnormal findings. Um, on this photo, but we did a B scan. And what this B scan shows, you can see it here with the arrow, there's an area of, which shows features of an exudative retinal detachment. So this white line here, it, it's a hypoechogenic um, area on the B scan, which is the retina. And this space right here is a hypo, we call a hypoechogenic region, which is uh, features of uh, exudative retinal detachment. There is also something called a, a T sign, which is noted on this B scan. And, and what a T sign is, or um, what a T sign is part of mnemonic of is posterior scleritis, where the sclera is a high, it shows as a hyper echogenic area or a white area, which forms the horizontal line of a T and it meets with the optic disc over here, this hypoechogenic area, which forms the vertical line of a T, and that's known as the T sign, and it is patognomonic of posterior scleritis. We also did an OCT, and we can see an obvious difference 
with the left eye when compared to the right eye. So the, the left eye showed that there was an undulating pattern of the retina in the macular region. And it is highlighted by the white appearance of the retina pigmented epithelium over here. And it's look, it looks wavy, which suggests that there was a issue in, at the level of the choroid just inferior to the, re the retina pigmented epithelium. And also to note that there was no intraretinal abnormalities, such as any intraretinal fluid or exudate or, or, or anything of that sort. So we were dealing with a choroidal lesion or a choroidal issue as noted on the OCT. So given our investigations and our examinations, it was noted that the left eye, there was a blurred disc margins generalized retinal edema, a white subretinal lesion, nasal to the optic disc, uh, exudative retinal detachment, which was 180 degrees inferiorly. So her assessment at this point was a left pan uveitis with posterior scleritis. Um, we were querying whether her, this patient had sarcoidosis contributing to her symptoms. So her plan at this point was to administer oral prednisolone at 14 milligrams and then to taper. We also started her on Predfort eye drops to that left eye to put every two hours for one week. And we also gave something known as an orbital flow triamcinolone. Now, this therapy is uh, it's a steroid. These three medications are steroids. And what they aim to do is to reduce the inflammation in that eye. She was also referred to the rheumatologist to rule out any conditions such as sarcoidosis and any other which may be contributing to her left um, inflammation or inflamed eye. And she was also reviewed, scheduled to be reviewed in a week's time. So she was actually uh, reviewed in a week's time and she was also reviewed weekly for the next four weeks. And she noted that there, were gra there was a gradual imp improvement in her symptoms, such as the headaches and blurred vision. There was a, a gradual improvement in the visual acuity. Her anterior uveitis, the AC cells, it was gradually improved and her choroidal lesion gradually went away. And she was also oral, her oral medication and eye drops were tapered to almost nil or, or to nil. And in her most recent visit, which was two months after presentation, we see that her visual acuity um, was, was better with her spectacles being 0.1 on the left when compared to two months prior where it was 0.2. And she also noted that her vision was also much better. Uh, examination findings and a slit lamp. Her anterior segment was now deep and quiet. There was disappearance of the anterior chamber cells and the uh, endothelial KPs, the keratic precipitates were resolved. And this is the image of her fundus on that visit. And we can see a, mo a much improvement in, in the retina on the left eye where previously the retina looked hazy and the disc margins was, was less well demarcated when compared to the right eye. But now on this visit, we can see that it looks normal, looks as the same as the right eye. Also, the lesion, which was nasal to the disc, the white subretinal lesion has disappeared. And we can see the comparison here, two months prior to treatment and two months after treatment. So there's a complete resolution. And this was her OCT of the left eye, where the undulating pattern of the, the retina and macular area has been resolved. And this is how it looked before. So you can see um, completely res a complete resolution of, of our, uh, presenting features. So I just wanted to show this picture. This is what we call a choroidal tubercle. And, and this is a feature of posterior scleritis. When, when seeing these things, one, one of the main differentials that has to come up in, is posterior scleritis. And that's it for my presentation. Um, Vikash, thank you very much. Um, I bring back Dr. Bola and Dr. Dwarka while they're coming back. 
Jan, go ahead. Ask us a question. Yeah, I found it was a very, very, at least for me, very interesting case. Yes, it uh, is. A, all I can tell you is my heart was beating a lot when I saw this patient <laughs> at the clinic, actually. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you the story about this case in a few minutes, actually. So this was not our first case that we had. Um, I had tachycardia if somebody ever checked my pulse rate at this point of time, because what was running in my head, I will tell you all in a second. Uh -huh. And, uh, but what made you think it was sarcoidosis? Could it have been any other autoimmune disease? Or? No, no, we didn't think it was sarcoidosis. We wanted to rule out sarcoidosis. So oh, we, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we, in fact, the blood test that was done did not show any sarcoidosis in this patient. Oh. Um, the reason why we thought of sarcoidosis was um, we had a similar case presentation about four months ago in our clinic. Um, in a very um, um, typical, um, um, similar kind of uh, age group, uh, but a male patient, overweight, etc., um, from the Asian background, uh, East Indian background. Um, what we found was in that patient, when we worked with the rheumatologist, because in these cases, it's a multidisciplinary um, team meeting and we work with them, we detected that gentleman had sarcoidosis and he couldn't tolerate um, steroids and we had to shift him to other medications. This was all done by the rheumatologist. And that's what made us think whether there was sarcoidosis contributing to the problem. Okay, well, thank you very much for sharing this case. No, 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 very, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Dr. Bola. Yes, uh, ex I agree with, with Jan. It's, it's a really excited and interesting case, Benit. Um, w when I look at this uh, lesion, that you have here over on the nasal side of the retina. It's nasal, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, if you look at the blood vessel, as uh, Vikash was uh, pointing out, you could see it take a, a turn. And, and that's how you know the lesion's elevated, um, as he rightly put it. And it's a pale nodule. So, so when I see it, you know, the, the first thing that comes to, to mind that's very worrying is, is if this is a, um, um, uh, a melanotic uh, melanoma. That's exactly what was running in my head in the first instance. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. you know, that, that's a, a pretty worrying thing if yes. you think about it in, in our population, especially because we hardly see it luckily, but it does happen. Um, so that would be the first uh, worry. The, the other worry is, is when we see uh, pale lesions, uh, subretinal uh, look like this, we worry that it's a secondary and we have Correct. to look for a primary tumor. Uh, so those would be the two problematic things that would be on your mind. So the first thing you have to do now is start thinking, um, well, what are the features of amelanotic melanomas? And really, you have to start looking for things like lipofusin pigment on the retina surface you have to look for a pigmentary change on the retina, subretinal fluid, things like that associated with the lesion. And, and this lesion, we, we're not seeing the full extent of it, but because it's elevated and there is SRF, you, you start worrying a little bit there. I, I'm not seeing any lipofusin pigment on, on the surface. So then, you know, that's against it. And you really need the B-scan uh, to kind of help you here to show the lesion itself. Um, so you really want to um, look at it. And, and, and this photo shows it a bit, but the subretinal fluid is actually affecting your, your ability to look at the uh, internal reflectivity of the uh, lesion itself and the height generated by the lesion. The interesting thing about the B scan is it shows a, a sort of homogeneous um, high internal reflectivity of the entire sclera wall. So Correct. That, that is not in keeping at all with uh, melanomas and uh, primer and secondaries. So I think you were well within the diagnostic right to say this is an inflammatory lesion of this, this sclera. And that's a nodule within that uh, realm and, and use a trial of steroids. And um, it, it seemed to be the obviously the right diagnosis and it worked extremely well. 
Um, what would be interesting to know is how you went ahead and advised in terms of investigation of what looks like a posterior scleritis, but a nodular type of posterior scleritis with associated uh, exudative detachment of the retina. So the, thanks, thanks, Dr. Bola. Um, you're absolutely spot on about the differential. So those two things ran in my mind first. Um, but the interesting thing was the inflammation, the pan um, um put it in favor of uh, inflammatory lesion versus uh, ocular melanoma. Uh, so, and to be honest with you, I have not seen in England such um, extents of scleritis. There were very simple scleritis patients. Nodular scleritis was not the norm out there. But because of the experience with the previous patient that I had, this one, I was a little more comfortable in understanding how this works. And also the fact that this patient, we don't have the photograph, it shows the exudative retinal detachment that also confirmed the fact that there is an inflammation going on with vitritis um, rather than uh, uh, actually a melanoma or even a secondary can present like this. But we did not think of secondary because um, patient did not have any acute features of illness, loss of weight or any other thing. So a complete medical history also was taken in this patient, which is um, necessary um, in these kind of patients. And in fact, this patient came from one of your colleagues um, in the community as well, because they visited the optometrist and who picked up that there was something unusual going on in the eye. One was referred to us. So this was an exciting challenge and uh, I kept my fingers crossed hoping that things would get better. Fortunately, the patient did very well. Um, uh, so Dr. Dwarka, your thoughts, please. Yes, guys, very, very good work and um, spot on with the differential diagnosis and diagnoses and the, the order of the importance of these things, basically looking for in terms of things like um, malignancies and then other issues, we need to bear in mind very, very, um, and yes, basically bear in mind that the associations with scleritis are very severe, and many of these patients die within five years of that of a presentation of a symptom. So the systemic evaluation is quite important follow up by the appropriate medical personnel, in this case, rheumatologists and others are important just for the sclerosis part of the issue, not looking at any other type part of the diagnosis, but just having sclerosis itself from a non, non let us say a non-infective cause has a, has a, a sort of a, a, a guarded prognosis associated with it. It needs that that um, vigilance with these patients. So again, I'm happy with the presentation, guys, and that is my contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dwarka. Um, um, any of our colleagues has any questions? Um, Zarid, um, Vikash, any other questions, comments? Anybody else has any comments about these cases? Uh, please continue to ask us questions. If there are no questions, then I will shift gears and um, start with my presentation. OK, just give me one second. Right. Um, OK, so here's my presentation. So my presentation is themed as another eye problem. Should we call the eye clinic or not? Um, we decided to do a um, presentation on um, emergency eye care simply because that was a request made by um, our colleagues in the community. So. This presentation, let me just get this working. Um, what do I do and when to worry? And I want us to walk through the eye and the problems we tend to watch um, or see 
in primary um, care practice and in the secondary care. And what I have high learned in Trinidad and in UK, in where I worked previously. So that's the main objective of this talk. The key message, what I would like to pass on to our colleagues and to everybody is how do we do a detailed history and examination? Is the problem in front of us um, self-limiting or a serious problem? And how do we manage this kind of a situation? The commonest presenting symptoms um, for anybody with problems in their eyes is reduced vision, redness in their eyes, pain, light sensitivity, which we call as photophobia, and discharge, which can be in the form of either being watery or pus related. And others, which are common with our retina practice primarily, with floaters or a partial field loss or other kind of symptoms patients might have. What is it that we see with lids commonly as an emergency problem? Trauma. And if you find yourself dealing with a patient who has um, tears in their lids with significant amount of swelling around their lids or tear involving the um, drainage apparatus within the eyes, this is not for um, the patient to be seen in an eye clinic because this patient needs um, emergency surgery um, in the hospital simply because they would probably need to be uh, put to sleep and have a thorough examination of the globe simply because there is a lot of edema in these kind of acute presentations and we need to rule out globe injury which can be hidden underneath this um, lid which are torn and usually lids are very well supplied with blood and if approximated well without loss of tissue they heal very well as um, following um, immediate repair this is also an acute presentation we have patients presenting with acute chalazions which swell up and present with preceptal cellulitis, as we see in the picture on the left, and a chronic um, chalasia on the right side. We tend to see this because these can be managed within our own clinics. Um, they can be managed with antibiotics in the first instance and, and express them if possible. If not, we do drainage of these cysts, which allows the resolution of that inflammation. 90% of the patients we see in our clinics seem to have some kind of meibomian gland disease. I would recommend everyone to concentrate on the meibomian glands and advise everyone about lid hygiene and use of warm compress as much and as often as possible for two reasons. One, it reduces the occurrence of chalasia and also reduces the symptoms of dry eyes by improving the quality of the tear film. Moving beyond the lids, we have our structure, the conjunctiva. Conjunctiva um, in the normal eye and an inflamed eye is different. And when there is diffuse congestion, we invariably call that as conjunctivitis. And the conjunctivitis can occur because of various causes. The commonest that we see around is a viral conjunctivitis, which is self-limiting, does not need any antibiotics, and usually tends to resolve in about three to five days. Patients tend to present with a gritty sensation in their eyes, just washing their eyes, keeping them clean and making sure that clean towels are used should resolve this problem. This patient does not necessarily need to be seen in the eye clinic, but can be managed in the primary care. But if these very patients move on to developing more significant problems with non-resolution of their conjunctivitis, then we obviously need to see them particularly the ones who suffer with allergy, which on examination have significant amount of papillae and follicles when we flip the um, lids over, particularly the upper lid tarsus, because these tend to rub on the cornea and produce a lot of corneal erosions. And we've seen in the bottom down picture, a lot of um, redness 
This can occur in acute viral hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, and these patients can present with severely red eyes, which are very, very uncomfortable for them. And in some cases, even with viral conditions, again, you have a lot of swelling of the, key, of the conjunctiva producing chemosis. On the right side, you have a child um, with a lot of discharge, which is purulent in nature. This is um, neonatal conjunctivitis. Usually these children are seen and admitted in the hospital because these things tend to get worse very quickly and they need to be um, on intense antibiotics and monitoring regularly by the eye doctors and the pediatricians because these children are not very well normally. So conjunctivitis is a very common thing. And in our clinics currently, we see patients walking in with allergy problem, and particularly when the Sahara dust is significant. This is another problem that we tend to see. Um, particularly in um, older people who present with diffuse or localized area of blood under the conjunctiva. They could present with either mild pain or could be asymptomatic, not notice it themselves or noticed by one of their family members. This could be precipitated when um, they have a bout of trauma, cough, sneezing, if they are on aspirin or commonly with hypertension usually resolves in 10 to 14 days. The only time this needs intervention is when the hemorrhage is significant, which is preventing the um, eyelid closure. Normally, a subconjunctival hemorrhage should have an um, extent noted. If you cannot see the extent of it and you feel that the eye is bulging, this could be a, a protrusion of a hemorrhage behind the globe, which needs attention. My recommendation in anybody who has subconjunctival hemorrhage is make sure that the eyeballs are not proptosed and there is no harm in checking the vision and also check out for relative afferent pupillary defect or color vision. Because if there's any changes such as that, it needs urgent attention as the uh, patient may have a hemorrhage behind the globe and causing compression of the optic nerve. Moving from the conjunctiva, um, we have our friend cornea. Cornea, as we all know, bends the light. 66% um, of the time, third of the light is bent by the lens. Um, the corneal problems are significant and uh, it is, it is got plenty of nerve fibers, so erosions of the cornea produce a lot of discomfort for any patient. They commonly present with pain, foreign body sensation, an excessive watering, and invariably a red eye. And the common thing that we see out here or in any drier environments is pterygium or con contributing problems which um, contribute to the redness within the eyes. When you examine these patients on a slit lamp or even with light with fluorescein on them, you find that the epithelium has got erosions um, uh, on the surface or sometimes even debridement of the epithelium can occur. As I said, this usually tends to occur on uh, in patients with trauma or severe dry eyes or even mild dry eyes. One of the things I would recommend everyone to watch out for is that we have seen um, our societies uh, have obesity significantly. So a lot of people have problems with closure of their eyelids on uh, when they sleep, which results to exposure keratopathy, which causes corneal erosions in the lower part of the cornea. So if they are overweight, do examine their eyes and recommend again, I repeat, um, a warm compress, lid hygiene and lubrication to improve the quality of their um, corneas. This is uh, dramatic. Um, a corneal ulcer, which can happen in anybody and everybody. And the commonest ones that I have seen are contact lens wearers. Um, out here, unfortunately, in the last three weeks, I have seen patients with trauma-related um, um, corneal ulcers presenting to the eye clinic, one secondary to trauma. Um, and these patients, um, when I sought the help of our corneal colleagues, um, came uh, two or three of them um, 
were suspected to have fungal infections and the third one was suspected to have pseudomonas as an infection. And the ones I used to see uh, commonly in um, the UK were contact lens related or um, acanthamoeba was also picked up in these patients. And they're always difficult to um, identify. Acanthamoeba is something um, where the pain is worse than what you see on the eye because of neuritis. And if this patient is a contact lens wearer and you do not trust the way they handle contact lens, seek urgent opinion simply because acanthamoeba can leave you with um, significant problems of the cornea, particularly corneal opacities, which may need um, corneal transplants going forward. Mechanical and traumatic injuries I've spoken about. Chemical injuries, alkali injuries are worse than acid. Again, these are best managed in the hospital simply because they need to be washed thoroughly. But if they're present to your practice, get their eyes washed thoroughly with water and, and, and seek an urgent opinion from one of the um, medical doctors, ophthalmology doctors, either in primary care, if not um, one of us, so that we can have a look at them and then refer them appropriately. Cornea is um, very interesting um, because when it starts causing trouble, you find colorful lesions and you see dendritic ulcers sloughing off the corneal epithelium leading to significant problems. Fluorescein um, is a, your friend and when you put it into the eyes using cobalt blue light, they stain up beautifully and delayed management of herpetic lesions leads to uh, what we call as um, corneal uh, um, opacities which will need interventions such as transplants going forward. So early intervention, and one of the things that we tend to do is debride these herpetic lesions to reduce the viral load and scar formation in these group of patients. And this is how an alkali burn looks like. And this patient, as you probably notice, cornea is completely opaque and the limbus is ischemic. This patient's got very poor prognosis and will need corneal transplantation with limbal stem cell transplant. So we need this patient to be seen urgently to see what we can prevent this eye from getting worse from this alkali burn. Now, let me just stop at this point of time and find out if anybody has any questions. Let me just check. Does anybody have any questions at this point of time? Happy for me to continue? Okay. So we saw our patient um, who presented um, with uh, uveitis um, and this was their first presentation of this patient that we saw in clinic um, two months ago. And most of our patients, um, it's usually their first visit, but it's useful to ask if a patient presents at your practice, have they had any uveitis or iritis in the past? because it allows you to direct them quickly into the clinic, um, giving us indication what is going on. Usually present with red, painful, photophobic, watery eye or eyes. And this could be split up into anterior and posterior um, uveitis or panuveitis if both the segments are involved. These patients need to be seen urgently because um, their life tends to be affected because of the inflammation. And the sooner we treat this, um, the resolution occurs quicker and recurrences can be managed appropriately. And they need um, combined management with um, um, medical colleagues, such as rheumatologists. And what is it that I would like you all to see in these patients if on slit lamp examination? If the patient is struggling to keep their eyes open, you know they're photophobic. If they do manage to allow you to examine, you see the ciliary flush, which is around the cornea. And if you manage to get a look in their eyes, they would have posterior sinecae. And Vikash spoke about um, minute keratic precipitates, and these are white in color when it, they are acute and pigmented if they are old. And if they're severe uveitis, they have fibrin on the surface of the lens and the iris. And in severe cases, you tend to develop what we call as hypopion. That's the collection of leukocytes in the lower part of the anterior chamber. And usually the anterior chamber um, is very um, murky in these group of patients. 
staying with the theme of um, inflammations, we have another common problem which we tend to see, which is called as the episcleritis, which is superficial redness of uh, on the eye, which is usually asymptomatic or mild pain. Tends to come on um, when there is um, coexisting collagen vascular disorders like rheumatoid arthritis or can occur without any rhyme or reason. And I tend to find out here in Trinidad um, a lot of patients presenting with episcleritis, having um, significant stressful life and, and, and finding um, their current life of online work significantly affecting their eyes and contributing to this problem. They're self-limiting um, and sometimes you need topical treatment. Scleritis, we've spoken about it earlier in the case presentation. There is deeper redness, there's dull, deep, boring pain, which keeps the patient up at night all the time. And again, the contributing causes are idiopathic, collagen vascular diseases like arthritis, SLE, Wagner's, and you can have even herpetic zoster contributing to the problem and sarcoidosis. Systemic treatment with non-steroidals is the first line of treatment in some groups of patients if it is mild or oral steroids if severe. It needs to be seen by a doctor and usually we tend to manage it by multidisciplinary team, particularly with rheumatologists because they tend to um, give these patients oral steroids or uh, steroid sparing agents like methotrexate, which might be suitable particularly in one of our cases, uh, the patient could not tolerate steroids and had to be given um, methotrexate. And this is how a patient with scleritis tends to appear, diffuse redness all around and um, blanching of this with phenylheparin um, does not resolve the redness, unlike in episcleritis. And in the um, lower picture, you see that the sclera has become thin and the choroid is showing it up as a bluish hue. And in the bottom right picture, you see extensive um, uh, necrotization of the uh, sclera resulting in a bluish hue. And this patient has gone on to developing cataract as well. And very rare cases, if the sclera is very, very thin, it could rupture resulting in the choroid exposing itself out and the eye becoming tisical and losing the eye completely. And this is a common scenario in severe rheumatoid arthritis or other coexisting um, um, uh, uh, autoimmune disorders. One of the things I would recommend to um, bear in mind in anybody with episcleritis or scleritis is not to forget to ask these patients um, if they have any gastrointestinal problems like after ulcers, irritable bowel syndromes, because I had a cousin of mine um, who I, on, epis, uh, on seeing his eyes, I noticed that his uh, redness is not because of dry eyes. And I suspected that he might have some inflammatory disorder. On investigating him, we found out that he had Crohn's um, ulcerative, uh, I mean, ulcerative colitis, which needed um, admission and all the treatment. And he's currently doing well with resolution completely of the redness in the eyes. And it was not related to dryness in the eyes at all at any point of time. This is a common scenario that we used to see in the UK, particularly during winter months. Um, you see what we call as a situation where the cornea is hazy. Um, you have a mid dilated pupil, um, redness, um, anterior chamber is shallow and the pa patient is in acute pain. Um, and when we check the pressure of this patient, invariably it's elevated. And we know we're dealing with a situation called as acute glaucoma. Um, acute closed angle glaucoma because there are other situations where a patient's intraocular pressure might be elevated but may not necessarily present with these kind of features. One take home message you find is that usually cornea tends to become steamed up or elevated if the pressure is very low or if the pressure goes above 40. Um, simply because the endothelial function starts dropping at that point of time and the main purpose of an endothelium is to um, dehydrate the cornea and keep it clear. And if the endothelial function is not very good, the cornea steams up and hence the drop in vision. This patient needs urgent treatment simply because they have presented to you with pain, headache, nausea and vomiting. As I said, they have redness and they are photophobic as well. 
and we spoke about reduced vision and halos around lights. The interesting thing is um, these patients do very well if they're managed quickly and usually do not forget the unaffected eye. They also need treatment. All these patients need to be managed in an emergency setup and um, usually um, med uh, eye doctors within the hospital or in the clinics can manage this situation unless the patient is severely ill. The routine way to manage these patients are with topical anti-glaucoma drops and um, uh, oral medications and also need a um, um, laser treatment like uh, peripheral iridotomy in certain situations, particularly the unaffected eye. But invariably, if it is lens contributing ac acute glaucoma, they need cataract surgery urgently um, at the earliest possible. And that is the way to manage this group of patients. So having shown you all the pictures about um, red eye, and this is a table showing you the difference between a subconjunctival hemorrhage, conjunctivitis, iritis, and acute glaucoma. How does the conjunctiva appear in these group of patients? How does the pupil occur appear in these group of patients? How does the cornea appear in these group of patients, anterior chamber, and intraocular pressures? And this chart allows us to understand the common red eye problems, which allows you all to understand what this patient might be having and appropriately direct them to the right place to seek attention. A subconjunctival hemorrhage and conjunctivitis can be managed normally in the primary care setup. A patient with iritis and acute glaucoma need referral into the services. I'll shift gears to the posterior segment, and um, if there are any questions, please ask me at this point of time for the anterior segment. Dr. Bola, Dr. Dwarka, any questions, any comments? No, no, no Vin, you're going pretty good there so far. Okay, All right. that's fine. Excellent work, Vin, so continue. Okay. Right, so, Shifting gears um, from the anterior segment to the posterior segment. Um, I've not spoken specifically about the lens, um, speak simply because lens pathology in an acute setup usually related to trauma. And I will show you some of the cases um, that we had to deal with in traumatic injuries of the eyes, which are um, emergency um, situations. The commonest that we see in our clinic um, uh, besides the anterior segment problems, uh, patients referred to us with acute onset of floaters or flashing lights uh, with floaters. And usually high myopes or patients with uh, not necessarily being myopes um, come through yourselves from the community to our clinics. And in the last 15 months that I've seen, a large number of these patients have been correctly diagnosed by yourselves as having features of a retinal tear and, um, and subsequent management of these patients. A retinal tear, when picked up very quickly, can be managed um, appropriately either with laser retinopexy or cryotherapy, which we do um, within the next couple of days if possible. Laser therapy are pretty much done on the same day. Um, cryotherapy is on the list that is available immediately, which is within the next two to three days. And if this patient goes on to having a retinal detachment, then we discuss with the patient based on the situation. I will show you all the uh, situations, uh, what we go on to do. But what, what one can do, what one can do in your clinic um, setup is if a patient presents with um, history of acute onset floaters, a slit lamp examination um, of the posterior segment, that is the anterior vitreous, behind the lens um, would give you an indication if there are any pigment cells present. And these are called as the Schaeffer sign, which is tobacco dusting. And it would um, allow you to know that there is something going on where there is a pigment release into the vitreous cavity. That means that possibly a retinal tear and the patient needs to seek attention at the earliest possible. So we are available um, at three um, clinic sites, as you all, all, all of you all are aware, um, at, at 
throughout the week and we also have our junior doctors available and our clinics are open about six days in fact seven days a week and if they need attention we could help you all with that what happens in a situation like this um, this is a patient who has a retinal tear with the lifting up of the retina which is corrugated and convex appearance and involving the macula so this patient has been referred to us with a macula of retinal detachment. So once the macula is involved and has been lifted off, it depends on how recently the macula has come off. Superior retinal detachments um, tend to progress very quickly, particularly in patients who have their vitreous um, uh, um, liquefied very early on. Most people are not aware of inferior retinal detachments unless and until the macula gets involved. Hence, inferior retinal detachments tend to be associated with what we call as proliferative vitreoretinopathy, retinopathy, which is scar tissue developing on the retinal surface, which makes it challenging to repair them. So let us talk about simple retinal detachments. If the macula is on, if the macula is on, um, they have a better prognosis, so urgent surgery is planned. If the macula is off, um, our rule of thumb is that if it was recent mac, uh, macula off, uh, which we can see on examination of the retina, we try and fix them at the earliest because this patient has a very good chance of regaining vision. If the macula has been off for a considerable period of time, the prognosis tends to vary for these group of patients. Nevertheless, the most important thing is to fix the retina. In younger patients, we have the option of using cryobuccal, where they do not need a vitrectomy surgery. And in older people, you tend to do a vitrectomy surgery, um, particularly ones who have proliferative vitreoretinopathy. retinopathy. We have all these options available with our team. And I point out that these patients need urgent referral to our clinics. Zared presented a very interesting case um, um, about a patient presenting with uh, acute hemorrhage um, in the fovea and particularly um, intraretinal. This was a patient I had um, in the clinic in the UK who presented with this kind of a hemorrhage of following a visit to the mountains. So this is a patient who had altitude um, retinopathy um, and they presented with this subhyloid lake of hemorrhage. The challenge with this patient is that it is across the macula um, involving the fovea. There are two schools of thought in managing this kind of patients. One, because now we have intravitreal therapies, they use the intravitreal agent to try and thin the blood and see if that helps it. By thinning the blood, you can actually apply laser treatment called as YAG laser to drain the blood into the vitreous cavity. My preferred option in this group of patients would be to offer a vitrectomy simply because you guarantee clearance of that blood. Blood, when left in the subhyloid place for a long period of time, causes damage to the photoreceptors and eventually the patient has problems with their vision. So um, sooner the better is the rule of thumb in this group of patients. And a small group of patients who present to the um, hospital with what we call as sub-arachnoid um, hemorrhages, can also have blood draining into the eye, which is called as Tursen syndrome. And I have operated on those group of patients as well, where they needed vitrectomy and removal of subhyloid bleed. And they did very well with improvement of the vision to 2020 after the intervention. And, and they stayed like this for a good period of time after the intervention. So any hemorrhage at the back of the eyes needs urgent attention. One, to find out what is going on. Two, to find out what treatment is the most appropriate for that given patient. It's not just the center part of the back of the eyes that we need to look at. We need to look at the periphery because they could have telangiectasias, which could help us identify if this patient has a variant of Coates disease. We all are very thorough with diabetes and diabetic related eye diseases. Um, diabetes produces plenty of problems and related to the eyes, we know that we have sight-threatening retinopathy 
and you all have been very, very good in referring the patients appropriately for treatment. We have um, early maculopathy, which can be treated very well with anti VEGF and laser treatment. And this patient has um, significant maculopathy, um, contributing to poor visual prognosis, but they do well with anti VEGF and triamcin alone. The sooner they come in, the better, um, uh, and also improvement in the diabetic um, uh, control helps improve their overall health. Non-proliferative retinopathy, as you all see, needs close observation. And this patient needs review every three to four months time because there is a 45% risk that this patient will develop proliferative retinopathy within a year. And particularly when you have patients walking in with a vitreous hemorrhage, we need intervention quickly simply because a large number of these patients are insulin dependent and they cannot see their insulin dosage application. So interventions such as using injections um, quickly to clear the blood if that is the cause and if there is no proliferative retinopathy in or such as um, glial tissues, um, then you can actually treat them with um, injections and laser to manage the situation. And if they go on to developing this kind of scarring, they it definitely need surgical intervention to preserve their vision as much as possible and at the earliest possible. And there are definite challenges. We have uh, come across a lot of challenges in this group of patients. We've spoken enough about retina and not to forget that the uh, nerve fibers um, are tracked through to the optic nerve. Just before I go to the optic nerve, any comments, Dr. Bola and Dr. Dwarka? I just noticed that the chat is a little bit active and I also understand that Dr. Bola is dealing with the queries. Any comments at this point of time, Dr. Bola? No, no Ben, you seem to be going through, um, you know, the different parts of the eye very nicely. Mm -hmm. Excellent okay. work. That's fine. I'll need carry on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, optic nerve problems. Um, and we see quite a few of them in our clinics out here. And it's just not in the UK that I've seen them. Um, a good segment of the population that come in are loss of vision. And they're not aware of reduced color vision, which we have to um, um, extract from them. And they also come in with visual field defect. But loss of vision is the commonest theme that we tend to see. And what do we see on the back of the eyes? As demonstrated in these pictures, they could have optic nerve swelling, unilateral. That is what I saw this week in a diabetic patient, which presented with the papillitis who needed intervention. We have seen patients with even a young child with a swelling of the optic nerve referred by um, uh, you guys from the community who had optic nerve head drusen. And that was um, useful to understand with the B scan and OCT scan of the back of the eyes to help us um, identify what's going on. And sometimes they need radiological investigations. We've had a small group of patients present with loss of vision and on examination reduced vision and detected to have optic neuritis. And this patient needed further assessment to rule out multiple sclerosis and we had to refer the patient to the neurologist. Um, papilledema, um, um, unilateral or bilateral, papilledema is usually used as a terminology when there is swelling in both the eyes, or we tend to use the word papillitis if it is a unilateral problem. And glaucoma is another problem which contributes to problems with the optic nerve as well. Even conditions like retinal vein occlusions can produce with um, hemorrhages around the eyes, uh, the optic nerve. Um, conditions like hypertensive retinopathy can produce these problems. So optic nerve evaluation is very, very simple. Um, what we tend to do is vision, RAPD, color vision. And those are your basic things that you need to evaluate any optic nerve um, dysfunction and you're able to pick them up and they need the further investigations and working with a neurologist is very, very useful in these situations. And this is something that I used to commonly see in the UK, acute vision loss in somebody who's over 50 years old and particularly female sex, and they would be identified as having giant cell arthritis. 
Um, and it is important that um, we rule out um, um, uh, giant cell arthritis. Hence, we invariably started these patients on um, high dose steroids, organized for them to have ESR and CRP, and then get them to be seen by the rheumatologist to look out for any other contributing problems um, if there is no obvious polymyalgia rheumatica. And this is a very common um, presentation that I used to see in clinic um, in the UK. I don't see that this that often in Trinidad, uh, unless they're appearing at the eye clinic in the hospital. Dr. Bola and Dr. Dwarka, any comments um, about these cases in Trinidad, um, acute vision loss with um, temporal arthritis suspicion? It is a less common thing in our population, especially the, the Indo, Indo and the African part of our, Africa, Caribbean part of our population. It's, it, is, um, it is also less common in the younger age groups, but it's okay. something that we have to have a, a high degree of suspicion for because it's one of these devastating conditions that could cause problems. So although it is less common, this, the index of suspicion has to be very high. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, um, Dr. Dwarka, simply because I remember my, um, one of my consultants when I was a junior doctor telling me a story that his uncle, while he was treating um, uh, one of the eyes which had presented with temporal arthritis, in fact, was in front of him and lost eyesight in the other eye in spite of initiating treatment. So just starting treatment does not mean that we're going to resolve the problem. And it's quite a dramatic problem because these patients lose complete in the independence of um, uh, their living um, following their loss of vision. So high index of suspicion um, is important, particularly in the primary care and urgent referral is necessary for this group of patients, please. I uh, Just on the same point, it actually happened to me. I was treating a, an elderly professor one from one of the U Birmingham universities and we had made a diagnosis of giant cell arthritis and asked the medics to look in and started on oral steroids. Vision in one eye was lost. And for some reason, the medics decided it wasn't. And within two weeks, the other eye was gone. So he was then blind in both eyes. Wow. Yeah, we, yeah I'm, I'm quite sure if we listen to the stories, there's quite a few of them. Um, so thanks for contributing to that um, um, very dramatic problem. And I think what we have done now uh, is in the past, we used to do temporal arthritis, um, temporal artery biopsy as a gold standard. And we radiologists are becoming better with using color carotid Doppler for the temporal arteries now. And I hope that we don't have to subject most of these patients to temporal artery biopsies um, in the future. So it would be interesting change in the management of these temporal arthritis situations so that we get a quick result in this group of patients. So shifting gears, and I'm quite sure everybody's very active in um, Trinidad um, and in England or India where I come from. We have cricket, we have tennis ball cricket, we have golf enthusiasts, we have squash ball enthusiasts. I've not put a shuttlecock out here. Um, I have seen injuries with every um, ball that I have presented out here. And in fact, I have had an injury with cricket ball and a squash a racket. And fortunately, and or unfortunately, it's effect, it, it, it spared my globe and hit my um, eyebrows on both occasions. Um, I've had patients who've lost their eyesight with golf ball injuries, which have ricocheted back from a push uh, shot. They needed some swing practice, of course. Um, what happens when an uh, injury like this happens with the ball? The globe is in such a position, and particularly if it is slightly deep set, um, the um, balls are such that they land in that perfect sweet spot and hit the globe and push it back and cause trauma to the globe and rupture the globe um, um, uh, and cause problems such as bleeding in the front of the eyes, retinal detachment, and many other problems. The fortunate thing within the orbital cavity is that the floor of the orbit is the weakest part and it gives way and there is prolapse of the um, orbital fat and the muscle which sometimes get entrapped. 
Hence, this patient needs to be seen urgently to treat the problem within the eye and also with the floor. Again, we work with maxillofacial surgeons to fix the floor, but the eye problem is dealt by the doctors. That's the eye doctors. And this, um, um, we tend to see, um, and in fact, last two weeks ago, I had a patient who walked in with a spring injury um, to the globe. Fortunately, it did not take away his globe. Um, the story with this particular patient, I have this picture, is um, he was a locksmith and he had 30 years experience and he was very careful and diligent. And in this unfortunate situation, he was in a rush to go home. He lifted his um, uh, safety goggles because he needed to finish this last job and the um, drill bit split and the drill bit, that split bit went through the eye and landed at the back of the eyes and he walked into the eye casualty. Um, and then we saw him and fortunately we removed um, his foreign body before there was infection. Um, and, and he did reasonably well, um, not losing his eyesight completely because this was not threatening his macula and he did not have a recurrent retinal detachment. So he was lucky and other situations that I have dealt with, um, they have not been that very, very lucky. And one of the things that I've learned from my colleagues out here is that patients tend to leave foreign bodies in a considerable period of time before they seek attention. And fungal infections are something that needs to be addressed. Um, Dr. Bola, you have considerable experience with intraocular foreign bodies. Um, any comments? Yeah, I, I think these foreign bodies, um, the majority that I've seen uh, really are the high speed foreign bodies coming off either a grinding type uh, history or a hammering type in history. And they really usually shape like this beneath a kind of saucer shaped um, yes. pointy looking, almost like a bullet you know, with, with, with sharp edges on every side. And they basically spin and come at a high speed through the air and they usually sterile. So the most common type are these. However, we do get some patients, especially from Guyana, who out in the forest chop in something and then um, they come with a foreign body. And they are the ones I think which are at high risk of infection. Because Correct. of the vegetative, yeah, because of the vegetative component of of the the uh, foreign body uh, and vegetative matter or, or soil or something. So the waka injuries in Trinidad is another a scary type injury because it could be stone, it could be other things, and and they bring in really um, organisms that are uncommon into the eye uh, that cause a lot a lot of damage. And obviously, you talk about the fungal, which is very difficult to treat intraocularly. Good. Dr. Dwarka, any experiences in Tobago and in Trinidad? As I would echo what um, Dr. Bola said, the, and in particular, the WACA and the advent of the use of the WACA has um, seen many eyes being traumatized by these um, projectiles because they, they, a lot of the times with the Wacker injuries, the material has vegetation on it as opposed to the grinding where they, they, we've, ster we've sterilized the, the, the foreign body. And these lead to not only to have a for intraocular foreign body, but an endophthalmitis and infection in the globe as well. So these mm -hmm. are very ser serious things that need urgent intervention. And especially in cases where we have not only bacterial, but we could have fungal problems as well, which are pretty intractable things to deal with. Yes. No, no, thank you very much for your contributions, both of you all, because yes, um, and, and they're challenging. And I, in fact, I remember still that I had a patient um, who was um, um, what, um, for the first time she was uh, trimming her garden with the, Trim, um, I think it's a trimmer, and one of the um, wires actually flew and went into the eyes. And fortunately for her, she it landed into the past planar area, 
and and didn't detach the retina or anything else. So we had to do a vitrectomy, clean that up, and take out the foreign body. And she did very very well. Uh, but it's a it's another it's a story for another day because she wanted to speak to the spirits before she decided to have the surgery. So it was an interesting experience for me. Well, this is not your everyday activity that you see, and I have seen this as well, walking into the eye casualty. And we do advise our a &E doctors not to pull that screw out or to use a screwdriver to fix it back in. And for DIY enthusiasts, um, please wear goggles because you don't want to see the screw in the wrong place. Um, and this is something that we see, um, nails, um, screws, uh, all in the wrong place within the globe. And of course, as you all are aware, this, this requires dramatic intervention and uh, they're not straightforward to sort out. And this is another group of um, instruments which are really, really, really dangerous. Ladies in the audience, um, your stilettos are very, very powerful to damage the eyes. And I have seen injuries where the globe have literally been taken off. Um, older people, we don't see radiators in Trinidad, but in England, you would find that older people in particularly old age homes, um, they would be sleeping beside radiators. And if they accidentally slip and they hit their high, particularly when they've had cataract surgery or something, I've seen situations where the lens implant and the intraocular contents pop out completely and they come as emergencies. You'd be um, intrigued as to why I've put the um, WC out there. Um, I had a very interesting patient who had consumed a lot of alcohol the previous night, walked into the um, um, toilet, the washroom, and he slipped and his globe hit the rim of the um, commode and his eye was gone. Um, when he walked in to see me, um, his, I, I, I was completely ruptured. And that's the power of the ceramic if you're not careful. So I don't know to blame the ceramic or the alcohol. Um, so one has to be careful that these things can happen. A mobile phone, phew, uh, they have wonderful connecting and communicating um, or, um, systems. But when you're passing mobile phones from one person to another, do not throw them because the edges of these mobile phones can take your globes away. And I have seen them causing severe scleral lacerations and having um, had patients um, losing their eyes completely. And um, when I put this slide up, most people laugh about it, but trust me, uh, I've seen injuries with every one of them. And as we all know, men are the most attracted to injuries in the eyes. Most are sport or work related. And uh, next is assault or road traffic accidents. We do not see windscreen injuries because of seat belt. Um, that it never used to be the case before the rules and regulations came into force. Um, fists, thrown objects, pellets, pellets and sticks are, are the other common things to strike the eyes. Most of these patients invariably land up needing enucleation if their globe is uh, ruptured with scleral lacerations extending to the back of the eyes. And they have multiple visits to the eye clinic where they need multiple interventions to try and put their eyes back. Some have been successful, some majority of them not that successful. Moving away from injuries, not to forget um, orbital cellulitis where the space um, around the globe can have infections. They could precipitate from um, a bee sting on the exterior or from sinus infections interior. Again, you find that currently we have orbital specialists um, in the UK, but not necessarily in Trinidad. So you need to work with your ENT colleagues um, to try and deal with orbital problems and particularly if there is proptosis. So in this patient, um, you notice that the globe seems to be symmetrical. Hence, the swelling is all around the eye. So there is features of preceptal cellulitis if they had any restrictive movements of the eyes or pain on movement of their eyes, you invariably say that it has gone beyond the septum and involving the orbit and it requires admission in the hospital and treatment with intravenous antibiotics. And this patient can pitch up to your optometry practice at any point of time looking for a quick resolution of their problems. They need referral to the services to be dealt with. So, Having taken you through what could happen with the eyes, 
Um, what I would like to leave you all with is, what am I looking for and how? Um, in a very simplistic fashion, um, use a bright light, uh, a slit lamp or an ophthalmoscope. Examine the eye in sequence, starting with the eyelids. This is after you have done your basic tests, such as the vision, RAPD, um, color vision where appropriate, visual fields, particularly confrontation if necessary, if it is appropriate in that given situation. And when you examine the eyes, do it in a very uh, systematic fashion. Look at the face, look at any obvious injuries, look at the eyelids, conjunctiva, cornea, pupil, then go into the lens, vitreous, retina, optic nerve, and also not to forget ocular movements, which gives you a complete overview of how the eye is and if there was any problems, deal with it appropriately. You're looking um, as you are examining the eyes for any signs for inflammation, discharge, loss of any corneal clarity, corneal ulcerations, as we discussed. At all times, be aware of the comfort of the patient and refer if it is appropriate. Mild conjunctivitis, mild allergy problems you might be able to deal with. Um, dry eyes, meibomian gland diseases you can be able to deal with, but anything more than that, please refer them and don't delay referral. And this is something that we used um, in our services in England um, as to what do we refer as uh, on the same day? What do we refer as urgent? What do we refer as a priority? And what do we uh, refer as a routine? And this is what I have spoken to you all today as emergency and urgent uh, cases. I have not spoken to you all about priority or routine cases. I'm happy to share this information and hopefully with time, we want to look at developing something along the lines of a CVRS rapid access or urgent referral form, which will be available through our website. And you could um, put in your findings out here, which could be utilized to um, refer across and then we can feed you back information subsequently, which means that there is a to and fro communication with regards management. The key thing I would ask you all to look at, ask your patient complete history and their concern, examine and comfort them, refer where appropriate. And I would recommend every one of you all to attend the eye clinic to see what kind of cases that we deal with, routine or emergency cases. If not us, go to the eye hospital, wherever there is the potential for you all to learn, because by learning how to manage these cases, you will know how, which are the ones you need to refer quickly and get them to be seen at the, urge, at the earliest possible with the key intention of preserving their eyesight. So that brings um, an end to my presentation and we will open the forum for discussions. Thank you very much for your attention. Can't believe I spoke for that long. Right, okay. Dr. Bola, Dr. Dwarka. Thank you very much, Vinit. This is a very comprehensive presentation and very well uh, categorized, so we could, uh, nice, nice to follow. I think a lot of take home messages could be found in it. And um, essentially, the important thing is to have a high index of suspicious, suspicious, refer when you're not sure, and certain things have a, a, a emergencies. We need to impress up upon our patients that they have to reach and re, and make contact with us. In a lot of cases, we're very we're willing and able to help in any cases that you need advice on, when, especially with respect to urgent and emergency cases. So thanks a lot again, Vinny. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you for your feedback, Dorian. Dr. Bola. Yeah, yeah thanks, Vinny. It's a, a very comprehensive uh, talk. Um, a lot, a lot uh, of stuff there that you, um, you covered. Uh, I think a couple of things just to say because we've been having a lot of chat on the site. Um, the 
the, the two things that you know really make something urgent is is pain and vision. So if a patient having uh, pain and they having uh, reduced vision or either or, then usually something's urgent is happening. You need to either figure out what it is, treat it at the primary care level, or re refer it on if you're not sure. Um, a, a lot of what I've seen with the optometrists uh, is that they have good communication with the ophthalmologist, uh, so much so that they would just call and say, you know, I have this case and uh, you, you want to see it now or, 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 or what do you want to do? And, and that's something I want to improve on and develop. So I, I think we should have both uh, phone uh, urgent contact numbers given to all the optometrists from us and also WhatsApp and email. I think WhatsApp is a great way to send a photo because you might see something and, you know, it doesn't make sense to you send something on which could be managed at the primary care level. So I, I would say if you see something, you know, take a photo of it. I see Rishmi does it. You know, she takes a photo of the retina and, you know, you see some hemorrhage or something and then she sends us the photo and then we could now develop um, uh, in terms of, you know, your retina uh, knowledge, we could, you, you could be developing it because you, you wouldn't really develop your knowledge if you refer everything on. You know, you really need to collaborate a little more with us in that regard. And I was telling Benit, you know, I want us to have these um, WhatsApp communication groups between optometrists and us so that we could get more involved in, in um, learning on the job because I find that's the best way to learn. You know, you see a case, you see something, and then and then we discuss it and we develop it. So that's something I, I think is the future of the relationship between the CVRS doctors and the optometrists um, that work uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the fraternity. So that's something I, I told the need, we need to start developing the shared care program much better. And, and see how, how good we could develop the relationship. Over to you, Ben. No, no, thank you. That is the important thing. And my experience in Trinidad over the last 15 months has been very good with our optometry colleagues. Um, and I noticed that they have been very proactive in um, seeking an opinion on something they're not comfortable with. And, and as you rightly pointed out, um, I noticed that WhatsApp is a brilliant way of picking up, uh, sending messages and feeding back to our colleagues in the community. And I think we have to use that um, system much more and be more proactive. And I am a very big fan of having a referral form coming in simply because there is um, a, a, a clear system of collecting data and replying back to that individual. So as soon as it's ready, we will relate back to you all uh, that form that we have demonstrated out here. It's something that we have been discussing for a little while, so I will share that with you all as soon as it's possible. Um, I will open the floor for questions with our colleagues. Um, I noticed Jan has got his hands up. Jan, go ahead. Yeah, OK, so <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, share the case of a uh, um, a lady, middle-aged lady, this afternoon, in fact, the, the past afternoon that I saw with the students, and she was complaining of increasing pain in the left eye. She had uh, uh, apparently before glaucoma on that eye, and she, she didn't want to use drops at all, so she went and do a trabeculectomy on that okay. eye. Okay. And now she she's, uh, I mean, Quite a, that was a number of years ago, and now she's uh, having some sharp pain. And uh, I noticed that, uh, I mean, when I say traffic electomy, I, I, I expect to see a tube or a bleb, you know. But what I saw was uh, the superior patch of the iris missing superiorly, so that you can see the edge of the lens okay. there. The pressure was okay. okay. So I told right. her that I'm not, I'm not a surgeon and uh, I advise her to uh, contact Dr. Dwarka, you know, because I know he, he deals with glaucoma. I hope I didn't make a mistake. 
No, no, no. I think you've done the right thing, actually. Um, one of the things that I did not show a photograph, actually, is of endophthalmitis. Um, um, that, that, that's something I, I can't believe that I missed that out because that's an urgent referral, although we referred to it. And it's interesting that you brought uh, to attention a patient who's had trabecolectomy surgery previously. Um, one yeah. of the problems with trabecolectomy surgeries um, down the line is an infection called as blebitis, which simply means that that bleb, as you rightly pointed out, can become very thin, can be affected by bugs and can cause inflammation and can result in infection entering into the eyes and causing drop in vision and pain. So you've done the right thing in identifying if everything was okay, if there was nothing acute and the patient has been referred. So we will see the patient and feedback to you. But it's an okay. important thing to have a high index of suspicion when a patient presents with glaucoma and has had surgery before. Has the pressure gone up? Is there another new problem such as an infection or an inflammation going on which needs attention? Okay. So, uh, so thank you very much for sharing that case. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, okay. Anybody else has any questions? I'm quite sure Dr. Bola is answering all the questions on the chat. No, we didn't have a, a lot of uh, questions, uh, clinical okay. questions. Just me and Jan was kind of chatting away there. Um, okay. okay. Yeah, that, that case that Jan uh, present or talked about there, I, I think the the, the uh, iris defect is the PI that they put when they do in the uh, when they do the uh, trabeculectomies. Yeah, so that, that's why it looks like it's a triangular shaped um, defect in the iris in the far periphery and is usually superiorly right uh, next to where they put the bleb. So, um, but it doesn't sound like that case really has um, end of uh, per se, but it's worth us having a look at it, but uh, usually they might just get like a dela next to the bleb site and they get a little bit of corneal erosion. So um, I show Dr. Dwarka is really the, the guy to look at it and decide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we'll be very happy to look at it. And um, sometimes in surgically, people have become a little bit overzealous in the, the PIs and it can turn out fairly large. Also, in some of the older cases of um, glaucoma operations, this procedure is called she's procedure where they actually took iris and had iris coming out of the wound so that you it developed a sort of a an ostium there. So you can have had a deliberate attempt at doing that as well. But certainly looking at it and to be sure it's okay is an important thing. Thanks. Thanks, Dorian. Thank you very much for the feedback on that. Um, yes, and one of the other things that I would like to highlight out here is, um, I think Dr. Bola alluded to it, anybody who is under our care or under your care has a new onset pain, new onset drop in vision. They need to be seen quickly. And that's, I think, the key message that we want to drive home. Because what we have understood being in ophthalmology practice for the last 20 plus years is that the sooner you address this issue, and I really like how approach of an endophthalmitis is done in our unit out here, which is aggressive management. And by doing that, what we have managed to see is preserve the eye, one, preserve vision, and also keep it functional as much as possible, because really makes a difference as to how quickly you interact with this patient, sort them out, comfort them, and they are handled much better. Intraocular foreign bodies may be the case, or any of these corneal ulcers, that I have seen, in fact, I'm being honest with you all, in the last three, two weeks, I have seen three of them, and our colleagues in Trinidad, we, we're not corneal specialists, but they've been so supportive that we sought help and resolve the problem, and we communicate with our colleagues via WhatsApp. So there is a genuine team effort to address emergencies. The key message that I would address again to you all, loss of vision or reduced vision, pain associated, refer them at the earliest if they need urgent attention. Okay, so I'll bring in Dr. Dwarka to say final words and then Dr. Bola. And I don't know if Zarid or Vikash want to say anything. Um, Dr. Dwarka? 
Thank you very much for the attendance, folks, and we're very pleased to have had the, the opportunity to share these little pointers with you. I want to thank the speakers, the excellent presentations, but Zared and Vikash and fantastic work by Vinit, who I heard it was a 45 minute presentation, but you did a lot more than that. It was fantastic, man. So overall, it was compressive, very comprehensive, and we're very pleased about that. And this. This is a very topical area because we always get asked and people always need to know how you deal with ophthalmic emergencies, how we deal with the acute red eye, how we deal with trauma. And Dr. Kumar's talk was, was addressed this very well. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dorian. Dr. Bola. Hi, thanks very much, Vineet. For, uh, you know, that's a lot of work and effort that goes into uh, preparations for these meetings. And uh, Bikash and Zared, you know, really interesting cases. W what I want to see going forward is the uh, optometrists uh, present cases on this lecture series. Um, it's something that I think we, we will benefit from um, because I, uh, Ibrahim presents on our teachings and you know there's some of the cases there that he presents I, I learn so much when he uh, talks so I know we have a lot to gain from each other and that's something I want to see going forward I also see want to see more interaction between you know the, the presenters and the people in the audience so please um, share your thoughts or or share um, any questions you have because I think that's also an important way to learn and develop. Uh, so thanks very much Vineet and uh, over to you. Thank you very much and um, I think we'll just bring in the juniors um, because they are the future as well. Um, Zarid and Vikash, any comments you all want to say? No comments but thanks guys for um joining in and listening to our presentations. So I appreciate that. And I hope um, we you know, brought something useful to the forum. That's what I can take. Thank you. Thank you, Vikash. And Zared? Uh, yeah, uh, afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for the opportunity to present. Uh, uh, we hope that everyone enjoyed the presentation from Vikash I and Dr. Kumar. And I know that we learn a lot, so hopefully you all if we will take out some take-home messages as well. So thanks again. Right. Um, on that note, and I have tried to keep our meeting to time, so thank you for cooperation for everyone. We look forward to your feedbacks um, simply because this meeting is constructed primarily based on the feedback that you'll give. And I will um, do injustice if I do not thank Anura for the commendable work that she has done to put this meeting together. Anura, thank you very much. And I keep forgetting to thank you at all occasions. Uh, you've done a fantastic You're job. Papa. But I also uh, wanted to heal out the islanders um, in the chat. So we have a couple of terms from Barbados, Antigua. Wow, wow. Uh, so I didn't well realize that. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. No, I didn't realize that. Okay, that's a wonderful. So we are we're going Caribbean completely now. <laughs> oh, that's so so nice, Anura. Wow, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And um, we are happy to share these presentations if you all want to use this. Not a problem from our point of view. And um, remember that this is CET approved. So make sure that you all claim your points, fill in the forms, and give us feedback as much as possible. And Anura will send you all the link for feedback. And uh, good evening and enjoy your evening and rest of the week. Thank you very much, everyone.